Uh, thank you, Mr. Elliott. Uh, Mr. Rosner. Thank you, Chairman McHenry, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me to testify on this important subject. To fully assess the risks to the United States and our proper role in the Eurozone crisis, it must first be clear what the crisis is and is not. It is not a bailout of populations of the weaker European economies, such as Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Hungary, or Belgium. After all, the populations of those countries are being forced to give up portions of their sovereignty in the name of austerity towards a fiscal union. Rather, <clears throat> it is partially a bailout of banks in the core countries of Europe, of their stockholders and creditors, who, failing to gain sufficient access to capital markets, would need to be recapitalized by their host country governments. It is a transfer of losses from bank creditors onto the backs of ordinary people without requiring any cost to those banks whose practices helped lead us to the problem. It is much a tale of overlending as it is of overborrowing. And just as nobody should feel undue sympathy for those who miscalculated the amount of debt they could service, nobody should feel for those who miscalculated their lending risks. The fundamental construct of the euro is flawed and its basis depends on, the, on substantially different economies and different levels of competitiveness among those economies sharing the same currency. Those economies have proven unable to rationalize their differences in a monetary union. In the United States, we have a transfer mechanism allowing tax dollars to be reallocated from the wealthiest states toward those less fortunate. The core European countries have demonstrated an unwillingness to accept such as necessity. The solution is either to move forward with a fiscal union complete with transfer of payments or break up. Ultimately, these are political decisions, and currently there appears to be little popular support in Germany, Finland, and the Netherlands for such a real fiscal union. Unless that changes, the Eurozone will have to shrink its membership or dissolve. Either result will inevitably lead to significant stakeholder losses, which importantly may now include the Fed. Proper U.S. policy should support our values around the world, not undermine them. We should support the apportioning of losses first to equity investors and then to unsecured lenders according to long-established and well-understood rules of priority. We should no longer support privatization of gain and socialization of loss. Doing so leads to distortion of market incentives and further risk-taking by those who have demonstrated an inability to properly manage risk. The European crisis demonstrates all too clearly that the problem is now well beyond moral hazard. A great many of the decisions being made in the name of crisis management are not being made by the elective re representatives of the people of the countries of Europe. Rather, they are being made by technocrats. Accordingly, the crisis is moving into a stage where it may represent the death of representative democracy, but also the destruction of global markets. I urge you to consider whether this is truly the approach to crisis management that our country should be supporting and endorsing. In May 2010, the Fed reopened swap lines to the European Central Bank in an effort to bolster liquidity for institutions in these markets, but at what cost? On November 30th of 2011, to increase the attractiveness of these lines, the Fed lowered the interest rate by a half percentage point. Since then, Three-month lending through the lines increased from $400 million to over $50 billion. While the actions of the Fed may well be justified and consistent with U.S. policy goal, they are nonetheless being made in near darkness and without substantial involvement by our own elected officials. As a result of this commitment of financial support, we are now supporting undemocratic approaches implemented largely by authorities who have demonstrated an ongoing inability to either recognize the scope and scale of the problems or come to a consensus on how to address the rolling crisis and prevent it from, spe from spreading. They have instead sought to deny the problems and downplay the impacts. When they don't like the market's assessment of the problems, they have chosen to shoot the message messenger and imperil market function through limitations of trading of sovereign bonds and credit default swaps. Are these proper policies for the United States to endorse? By providing unlimited swap lines to be used by institutions in the Eurozone, institutions which may in fact be insolvent, not just illiquid, we have effectively allowed the Fed to direct U.S. foreign policy in support of a single currency for the Eurozone. As the risk of the losses of the Fed rise in the event of a breakup of the Eurozone, they seem likely to commit us further to support that union in its current form. 
While the Fed has technical expertise in these matters, such policy decisions should not be made without informing Congress. I suggest that you consider whether the Fed's efforts should be directed more towards quantification of the problem and providing technical advice to Congress. Dodd-Frank sought to reduce the opacity and required the Fed to disclose which firms received loans from the discount window. In the spirit of that legislative intent, why hasn't the Fed required the ECB to inform them of recipients of funds from swap lines as condition of the arrangement? While there are many more questions to be asked and answered, these questions suggest there are real reasons for the Fed to have concern about ongoing instability in highly interrelated markets of Europe. There also appears to be a real and rational basis for the actions they have taken toward short-term stability goals during the crisis. Furthermore, we can believe the Fed is acting appropriately, but without more information and a broad discussion, we don't know whether the Fed's focus on short-term stabilization properly aligns with longer-term U.S. policy goals. Perhaps we should support a European Union, but have our elected representatives affirmatively decided in favor of continued support for a single currency? It seems fair to consider that such foreign policy decisions should rightly be made not by an independent central bank, but instead by the Secretary of State, U.S. Trade Representative, and the Secretary of Treasury with informed consent of the President and Congress. Thank you, and I will be pleased to address your questions. Thank you so much.